Osno Gola here, CEO and co-founder of the Gen Z Club. So for those that don't know, I don't know why you wouldn't know, the Gen Z Club, we host quarterly network events across the UK, empowering and inspiring the next generation of future founders and leaders. What it also looks like is we do four events a year, an award ceremony, the Real Estate Conference, the Entrepreneurship Summit, and the Careers Fair, all around getting you guys to learn, educate, and meet like-minded people. We also have quite amazing partners. We partner with the likes of Barclays, Lloyds, HSBC, BBC, and many more amazing organisations. And also, we've actually been lucky enough to be named the top Top 100 SC businesses in the UK two years in a row, 2023 and 24, and hopefully next year as well for the help of you guys. So you might be wondering why am I today in a podcast studio? Well, I'm about to answer that question. The Gen Z Club is launching their very own Gen Z Club podcast, which means we're going to bring in to you guys some of the most amazing guests, some most amazing stories, right to your YouTube, your socials every single couple of weeks. So strap in, you know, stay tuned, and I promise you, you will be inspired. Your network is your net worth. <laughs> I hope you said it at home. But today we've got a very, very special guest. Our first guest, um, it's only right that I bring on somebody close to my heart today. He's literally the reason I'm, I'm alive. <laughs> so um, I always say this man, everywhere I go to, one of my biggest inspirations, I met a lot of incredible people, not many as incredible as, as the person that is the guest today. So I'd like to introduce the world to my dad. Welcome to the podcast. Very first guest. How do you feel to be the very first guest? Thank you very much, uh, Austin. Um, I am Andrew Kolo, CEO at Love Property Limited and CEO of Vigo Wellness Limited. It's a pleasure to be one of your first guests on the podcast and I look forward to a great show. Thank let's you. Get, let's get straight into it then. So, um, so of course, the reason why um, I'm bringing my dad on today is because obviously he's got an amazing story, but also we have got an event next week Saturday, the Real Estate Conference, and he's actually going to be speaking alongside me for a fireside chat. So unfortunately, that event, we've only got about 20, 30 minutes, but you know, I think that's not enough time to really unload um, the story that is behind um, my dad. So there, I think it makes more sense to get on the podcast well and sit him down and you know give you guys the inside scoop to what it's like. You probably see me on the social media, you probably see um, you know what, what I do in the socials, but a lot of that has come from what I've learned from... My dad. So, you know, let's get into it. I know you guys wanna uh, are probably wondering why on earth I brought him here. What, what what's he got to do here? So let's get into it. So um obviously I'm your son. <laughs> so Absolutely. so I know yes. I know a lot of things. Um however I understand that especially as now as now I get older, that in the growing up in a family setting you don't always say everything that is like I don't know every single part of your journey and there's probably things that you hide from your family or you know hide from other people which is natural and of course um, I'm 24 now so there's a 24 period 24 year old period and probably even more where I don't know what was ha kind of going on so I like to like take take us back to where it all started like I understand that you know you grew up in extreme poverty um, with you and your, I think, eight siblings, is it? It's seven siblings. Seven yeah. siblings, eight, Absolutely. including yourself, um, your mum and your dad um, in Ilan, Nigeria, which is where you're from, and where, which is obviously where I'm from as well, being your son. So take us back then, like, what's, what, what's your earliest memory growing up in extreme poverty? The biggest memory was the hard work that was involved, especially for my mum. Obviously, the civil war wasn't... A thing to remember, that was a civil war in Nigeria. We were born just before then in the northern part of the country. Uh, going forward, during the war, we have to go back to our state, which is a uh, present-day Delta state. And uh, we all went back to the village, and my dad virtually lost everything. So after the war, he has to rejig. One thing he set us to do, and one thing he decided on time was... He was going to make sure that every one of us, the eight of us, have a degree from the uni. Why growing up in the poverty circumstances where we grew up in a village called Agbo, a township called Agbo, in present-day Delta State as well? Life was tough. I was very helpful to my mom in her stall, selling uh, foodstuffs as well at my spare time during holiday times as well. My dad, fortunately enough, had to basically scrap to for uh, my mom, they did it, worked so hard and made sure they gave us education. Uh, from there on, I went to present the Ambrose Ali University in present the uh, Edo State. We're gonna get onto the university experience as, as, as it goes on, but right now I just understand, first of all, like you mentioned the war, 
So I'm guessing you, you probably submit more detail, but the war was the war between the South and the East yeah, and they the did North. Not, yeah, the Biafra and, war, the so called proper Brit Biafra war. And obviously, like your dad and my granddad, he was quite wealthy in the North. Absolutely. And then because of the war, because he was Christian, right? That's right. Or he was Igbo. He was Igbo. He, he was Igbo, yeah. Yeah, because we were Igbo, um, they kind of wanted to kill all Igbo people. So well, no, it wasn't necessarily that. It was uh, basically the war started because of where well, there's tri tribal yeah. issues involved. But when you look at the, whether they want to kill the Igbos or not, it was partly here yeah, because where you have a Sabbath today, where majority of young men, they were all mothers, called out at the time and all killed. I have a very fr good friend of mine here in London. He lost his dad and he has never forgiven. It's a huge memory every time he remembers what went on there. So, but the war was a turning point for majority of us that were born before the war, where parents were doing so well in the north and had to abandon everything yeah. they had to go back to the eastern part of the country. So my granddad and your dad was working as a, as a chemist, right? Yeah, my dad was, a, your granddad was yeah. a, working for USC as a chemist. And he had to flee to the south That's and right. leave everything he had. And eventually when he went south, he yeah. st stayed in the Ila and he was essentially poor because yeah. he had to leave everything he had. Imagine being a stockkeeper for USC at the time, then going back and returning to farming. And uh, that was a huge change in his life. And it was that difficult for the mom as well, being the only son mm. and the dad as well. So when you go back and put all that together, from a good job, he had houses in the north at the time which obviously lost one or two of them. When he went back to reclaim it after the war, they were no longer there. So, but in reality, it was a difficult time for him as well, for my dad, yeah. who is your granddad, who is late now. He only passed about three years ago. You had the privilege and opportunity to meet him severally. So he really never recovered. I think at a the point there was a mental breakdown at, at a point as well, which was expected and uh, under the circumstances, eight children to care for. Actually, we were nine of us, but the first one passed at the age of two. You know, so mm. with that, going back, catching for 10 people, for my mom, my dad, back in the village in Ella, was always going to be of acts. When you came to South, I never asked Kush before, what made him settle in Ila? So Ila is a small village in um, Delta State. So what, what was the reason for him? Was it just random chance? Because if you know the history of this of us from Africa or Nigeria, where your parents are from actually is where you come from, not where you're born. Now, the parents are from Ila, the mother, that's my grandfather okay. now, my grandmother, that's your great-grandmama, your great -grandma. They were all born in Ila and they were subsistent farmers. So they farm until they... So when he went back to Ila, he has actually built a house in Ila, like most of us do. Yeah. We always go back home and build homes. So he's built a house. So he had a six-bedroom house, which was the most convenient place for him to retire, uh, to run back to, rather not retire to. I remember vividly, sometimes in the day, we have to run into the bush and uh, running into the bush because you yes gunfire uh, gunfire and all that in places so we all went to the bush and uh, stayed the night in the bush as well at a point because in front of our house i remember vividly during the war sometimes they actually have a police and army checkpoint right in front of our house in Ela, which we've been to several as well so you know it so they had step because it was elevated on the ground. So you have to climb the step to go there. So the army boys actually sat out there all night. Yeah, they were tough times. So the yeah. army were literally right outside your house. Outside out. the house. Yeah. Mounting checkpoints as well. And the that's where you, army. And that's why you hear yeah. gunfire because they're shooting. That's why because they're shop. shooting, yeah. And so. then, so putting it back on you then. So what's your earliest memory of being growing up in poverty so obviously you knew that you grew up in poverty but obviously when you're born you don't know that it's poverty until uh, so what age were you like wow like i'm living you in know poverty. it's difficult uh austin because you hardly have two square meal a day and your first meal of the day probably come to you at about 1 p.m mm -hmm. so that's to tell you today you wake up in the morning breakfast is ready and everything is there for you the next meal wasn't there like that so before they put things together the meal for the day it will be one o'clock midday before you have the first meal then throughout the day you're just scavenging for anything that comes through 
till dinner time. Sometimes you get something for dinner, sometimes you don't. What did like your meals look like then? What would like a meal look like? Huh. like some, the meal was like basically... Nando's or no Nando's. No, yeah, that's luxury. <laughs> Where do you get that from? <laughs> uh, it was always going to be a meal of uh, bread, a loaf of bread. Uh, ten of you for a loaf of bread. You'll be sliced and shared into ten portions. So everybody gets a bit out of it. And you have this big bowl of uh, boiled water. Then you drop a tea bag in there and a tin of uh, pig milk in there with a couple of sugar. They stir it and everybody have their own cups. When eventually everybody shared. You shared the, you shared the cup? Yeah, you, they just tip a bit for you into the cup and uh, maybe what I would call maybe two slices of bread equivalent. And for a young man, most of us, we were already in our 10s and uh, 12. That wasn't going to carry a great deal. Yeah. But that's what you have. And uh, you had, and uh, what do you do? So that's your earliest memory of being in poverty like that's that, it, the, the yeah. meals and the scene, like two loaves yeah. of bread and some, some sugary water. The biggest memory for me was living in two rooms, not in a flat. We call it Face Me and Face You in Abu. Um, you share in a big compound, you share your toilet facilities and uh, the kitchen. Now, at night, because you have to sit, sleep 10 people in that space, so at night, the furniture will be, you have to stack up the poor furniture. Then once you have your furniture stacked up, you manage to get some mattress on the floor, or what we call mats, like a carpet. Mm -hmm. And you're already tired all through the day anyway, because it's hot. So you just go to sleep, mm -hmm. you know. And in the day when you wake up in the morning, that's so why you wake up early, if you're expecting visitors, your parents are expecting visitors, you have to get up early, put the chairs back in place so that it will accommodate people. So that's the biggest difficulty as well. And some nights, if your parents have visitors, you might be just out, outside basically at the balcony of the biggest big compound that you have probably another 60 people living in. Mm -hmm. And uh, while you are out there, you'll be waiting for your dad's guest or your mom's guest to leave before you do that. And that age as well, you're tired anyway because you've been out probably running around the streets all day playing. You look at your clothes. We basically share clothes amongst ourselves. My five other brothers, I have five, four brothers and two, six, three sisters. Shoes and all that was luxury. So most times you're actually playing outside with our shoes. Yeah, and you used to share clothes. Your yeah, brothers. to share your clothes. Yeah. And then was that like that was normal in school? Like everybody in the, in in the area had. Absolutely, that. you went to school obviously with our shoes. Okay. So you have to run with your ten toes and all that. You get bruises, cuts and all that. But sometimes they heal quickly as well. <laughs> sometimes you have big sore which you have to deal with. Your parents have to deal with. And the biggest way to treat so obviously in Africa was to get lime. Use the lime on top of the saw, which is a good decision. Like, like, like a cut? Yeah, if you have a cut. Yeah. yeah. If it turns to saw, if it's not looked after, then you have infection. And lime, fresh lime was always a good way to go. So you just <laughs> use the fresh lime. Of, of obviously, it hurts. So, so what would you like, if, if someone gets ill, what would you do if someone was sick or ill? Oh, no, no, no GP? Sick. No, no GP. That's luxury. Where do you get that from? <laughs> you know, if someone was sick, uh, essentially, you have to go to the pharmacy. Uh, funnily enough, at the time, my dad, having worked for uh, UAC pharmacy, I had a good knowledge of medicine anyway. Okay, yeah. So we obviously go to the pharmacy and he knows what to recommend and uh, we get them and you get back. The major illness at the time was malaria. Yeah. We, we suffer from malaria a great deal because... You have open sewage where you live, so there's obviously going to be a whole mosquitoes. lot of mosquitoes. Yeah. Then apart from that, as well, infection. Mm. You sometimes infection can easily be classified as malaria because there's no proper test and diagnosis. Yeah. But the moment you're treated for malaria, you have it, then uh, in another month or two, malaria is back again. So you go <laughs> through the same circle all yeah. the time. So then growing up then, so to move away from obviously the poverty, um, when you were living in these environments and you're living in, you know, extreme poverty, what was the mentality of yourself at the time, like being 10, 12 years old? Did you always believe that you're going to achieve great things? Did you believe that you're going to go to move to London one day? Like, what was your mindset? Or did you just think that this is going to be my life forever and this is normal? Uh, at that stage, everything is luxury to you. 
you know, and the uh, things you imagine, and you never imagine you'll ever get there anyway. Mm. Well, how? How will you get a ticket to go to London? How would that happen? It's not possible. So did you have like dreams of like nice cars and nice big, big properties? Went, yeah, that's right. My dad had a car before they were, had cars before they, yeah. after the war, he lost everything. So we were in boarding school sometimes because accommodation wasn't there. So through his rental income from the north, from the two properties that was left at the time, which, believe it or not, it's more one of the properties still there, which we are trying to get rid of today. Now, with that, he sent us to boarding school. My elder brother was so intelligent, Henry. So he went to secondary school on scholarship and uh, uh, everything paid for. But, but I really understand, like, your mentality. So when you were 10 years old, because obviously like, even myself, maybe, you know me, when I was younger, I wanted to be a professional football player. Yeah. I had these goals and ambitions. Absolutely, did you, yeah. did you Did you have any goals and dreams when you were 10, 12 years old? Like, what was your goals and dreams? Funnily enough, the, my dream was to be in business because uh, I was most times with my mom and I was in market store with her helping out most times. So it was a thing that I actually looked forward to, to be in business. Now, but the extent of business, you never imagine that would be where we are today because mm. it was about survival. Uh, when you want to, when you, are the, when you try to survive... You can't really dream. You cannot really dream because mm. the dreams are huge and uh, you never imagine it. So would you say like, obviously we'll get into what you're doing now, would you say that you saw where you are now coming or, or is it still like you can't believe that what you achieved? Absolutely. Because... Uh, you saw it coming or you didn't see it coming? No, I didn't see it coming. Okay. No, I didn't. It was... Uh, I never imagined it would yeah. happen the way it's come. So like your mentality was always, I'm in survival mode, let me just get through another day, let me, just, let me just survive another day. Let me day. survive, yes. And then, then you went to school. Yes. And what was the, what was the journey like from going to school and then moving to the UK? Now, going from school, um, secondary school, I was in the boarding school for one with my brother, my younger, my elder brother, we all went to the same secondary school. Going to secondary school, my mom traded between the next villages, called say look and a live for four days. There was so much accident on that route anyway. So I was aware, because during all the time I spent time with her, so I was aware of her itinerary. So majority of the time she traveled through on the tube and places. There was always accident at the junction of the school where we were embodied, where we were bordered. But... So I always think sometimes, students come back home and say there's been an accident at the junction. I always imagine my mom could be in there. Mm -hmm. And you know what Nigeria is like, when it happens as well, you're just at the mercy of God. But touch would it never happen. So went through secondary school, got admission into what you call Ambrosali University today. Did uh, three years there. Uh, obviously, I studied English. And, uh, the reason you studied English? I didn't like law. That was my next option. Uh, why in secondary school I had some medical issues with my legs. So I lost about two terms in class three at the point which I would have gone into physics and chemistry. So I lost that. My younger brother was actually copying the lecture notes, sending them back to me while I was at home. Till tomorrow is still a mystery. What happened to your leg? Was it a snake? But... I don't know. Till oh. tomorrow is still a mystery how it happened. So I actually lost two terms at class three, what we call class three then. And that's the stage where you go from just basically choosing your subject, mathematics and all that. Secondary school, I was the head, uh, the general prefect of the school, as primary school, primary six. So that means uh, you're the head boy. Yeah. And uh, I was the second person because you have to do entrance examination to go to secondary school. Uh, only one boy was ahead of me, and I was the second person. Oh, so you were smart. Yeah. But with the situation with my mom and all that, that sort of affected me because psychologically, I was thinking about my mom's survival, you know. Then going on from there as well, you think about um, what would have happened if she wasn't there tomorrow. And uh, the transition as well, going on to Ekpoma. So at that stage, I got my five credits, but they were at subjects that I got my five credit, which was enough to take me to Ambrosali University to study English. And why haven't you learned that you just couldn't walk? I couldn't walk. Yeah. Okay, there, for two it, months? It was much more than that. It was about six months period. Wow. And uh, there were no proper medical diagnosis this tomorrow. It's still a mystery how the legs healed. So did you think you're never going to walk again? Yeah, at a point. They actually said at the hospital that the leg needed to be amputated. But what? it wasn't by acts of God. 
Mm. He just healed and uh, went back to school. Uh, there were other theories, you know, in Africa, they believe in uh, native things. And uh, witches, which is, yeah. But my dad never believed in any of that. Yeah. So, so tomorrow, my dad will always say to you, it's not possible for someone to harm anyone if you don't believe, which is, of course, it's true. So you just woke up one day and your leg was just fine again? It just, just swollen. And uh, and you could walk? I couldn't walk. So I had to go home. I was in boarding school at the time. So, we, so I spent about six months back home. But then when it recovered, you just woke up and your leg was just fine. And it you could was walk. fine again. And uh, what did you celebrate? We you went to, they got us some native herbs, which yeah. we put on the leg and that sort of healed it. And, okay. So it's still a mystery what happened there till tomorrow. Um, I, I still remember it vividly. And because of your leg, yeah. um, you couldn't go to school, so your your brothers were sending you notes Lecture to learn. Notes, yes, and then that home. only meant that you can get you only got a certain amount of credit. So that's right. you only had the option to study English, you didn't have the option right. to study anything else. That's right. Because you need things like physics to go to the lab, chemistry to go to the lab, biology and all of them. I didn't have the opportunity because yeah. you can only copy the literature, Bible knowledge, and all the other ones and sent home for me to mm. study. Thinking about it, with hindsight, I should have gone back and repeat the class three. But in saying that, because of the poverty in the family as well, when I finished my, I had to repeat primary six because my dad didn't have enough money to send me where I had my elder ones. So I lost a year. So, but with hindsight, maybe I would have uh, gone back and repeat the class three get get uh, to terms with the science subjects and mm. all that but today is one of those things yeah so you get to university now thank grace to god your leg is healed mm. and you're at university now and then so you're at uni you're how, 18 19 20 oh uh, yeah about that age about age of 20. okay and yeah. then and you're studying english yes. at this point in your life what where's your mentality are you thinking i'm gonna move to the uk are you thinking that i'm gonna be a an, an english teacher yeah as a young person you're confused anyway you don't know because yeah uh, of course yeah parents the parents i had they were not the type to guide you. They just want you to get education, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. So I went into uni and uh, I had fun. I <laughs> uh, got installed, involved in student union politics as well, where I was uh, secretary general of the student union at our So you're always like a boss. Like in school, you were the head boy. In uni, you were doing politics, so you're yeah, head of this. So you're always, you're always like being in control. You always like being like the, absolutely, yeah, okay, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I like to be in control and do things my own way, which I did. And then did did, you, did that ever like rub people the wrong way in school? Where like the people think that Andy he's doing too much. Like why is he always bossy? Like or did you were you always able to stand your ground in 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 Nigeria? Cause I, I, I can imagine bullying was prevalent and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, I did, because uh, if you have to have a set mind to a large extent or what you want to do to an extent. And at that stage, you already are aware of your background and you have a lot of people as well with different backgrounds. Because there are so many people, it's a good way to begin to identify who you are yeah. from the uni. Okay. And uh, because of the people you meet as well, your colleagues, your discourse, your social life, it's your social capital. Mm. And these are all innocent set of people. There's nothing at stake. Yeah. Everybody's happy to go to parties and join one social club or the other and all that. And uh, it was fun. It was a good time. Mm. Absolutely good time. And, and you're studying English now. So what's your aspirations? And that, you know, are you thinking that I'm going to go and go to the UK? Are you thinking that... No, funnily enough, what happened was... I remember one of our teachers were in a class one day. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, one of my lecturers... And uh, ooh, everybody was talking, what would they want to do in life? And I said to myself, there's a popular town in Nigeria called Onicha. Everybody that virtually lived in Onicha were market traders. Mm. So I just said from there, like, I'm going to go back there. I'm going rich. to go to Onicha and I'm going to be a market trader. Were they rich in that place? Yeah, people made money. Yeah, yeah. They're very okay. wealthy, clapped yeah. and all that. And I said, I'm going to go back to Onicha and I'll be a market trader. Everybody laughed, mm. you know. And... Um, so when, we, when I graduated, there wasn't much for me to do in Nigeria, obviously, and uh, looking into transition to UK. I had my brother in the US, my eldest brother. Obviously, I had to raise money and find a way to come to UK. So I met my, I discussed with my eldest brother who was already to find a way, his way to study in the US. So I said to him, Marco, um, so what do I want to do? And I said, I want to go overseas, which is a dream. 
of every young Nigeria at the time. At the point, my name is Andrew. There was this uh, television advert on telly, checking out. Uh, checking out was what you call Nigerian Day Japa. And I said, I'm checking out. So as God will have it, I went to the British High Commission and they gave me my visa to come to UK. It wasn't on the card when I was in the uni, but because you never imagine, those were like uh, tall order. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that you're going to have to achieve, mm -hmm. knowing the family background uh, where I'm from. So at university, the dream was always to go to UK because I'm My guessing... dream was to be a market trader. Yo, my Gen Zs, I'm so, so sorry to interrupt the episode, but this is really important. My dad will be speaking at a Gen Z Club Rosie Conference next week. So if you're this episode, we should get down there to see him and some other incredible speakers. Tickets might be sold out by coming to this video, so make sure you get yours right now to secure your spot. It's honestly going to be a life changing event, man. But anyway, back to the podcast. So I'm, I'm guessing in the in Nigeria and Africa, the Europe has seen and America has seen like the promised land. Like if you go to UK or you go to America, America you've made it. You've life. made it, that's right. So, like, so that's why like you're like, you don't know what you're going to do in the UK. You just need to go there because when you're there, you'll be free. Yeah, well, yeah, that's always the, till tomorrow it still happens. Yeah. yeah. Because of the economic circumstances in Nigeria. So everybody always want to go overseas. So what made them, cause I, I, I can imagine maybe it's harder to get a visa now than it is back then, but when you went to the embassy, what made them give you a visa? What was their reason? Because you have to meet, fortunately enough, uh, my brother being in the US was able to provide his bank account and the capital that was needed at the time. Oh, so more financial. He more financial support to okay. make it happen. Yeah, and that's one thing that obviously being... Yeah. Because Colorado, you need that, obviously. Yeah. yeah. That's one thing as well, like obviously being in the color that I've noticed is that... Um, your relationship with your brothers is really, really strong and you guys always lend each other money. Absolutely. And all these kind of things. So when you got to the UK, what happened What happened next? So you got here, you, you got your visa, you came to the UK. Did you have any idea where you're going to work, how you're going to make money? No. When you arrive, obviously, you have to think about survival because now you don't have your parents. And uh, as you know, I don't have a brother, I don't have a sister in the UK. So it's going to be about survival. And that survival with either instant kicks in for you and you begin to think how you're going to survive. But one, you have to be hardworking as well because survival means you have to graft mm. and out there. There's nobody to talk to. There's nobody to reason with you. The only people you have will be actually your friends you've met on ground. And some of them have similar problems like you as well. Mm. And the similarities are, okay, where do we go from here? We need to buy housing. We need to have a roof over our head. We need to, what are we going to do? Majority of the people at the time, housing job was basically what was there for everyone, you know. So, but first, before you get there to raise your money, to get your cars and all that, you have to graft in factories. So in your, in, so you're, in your case, you went to UK, you got your visa, mm. and you, did you know where, you're gonna, where were you going to sleep? I have a friend, uh, a friend of mine, uh, I met him through my elder brother. He was in our chief poly at the time. They all studied electronic electrical engineering, Richard or more. So Richard was already here. So when I called him and uh, I let him know that I'm coming to UK, you just imagine you're going to a place you don't really know and there's nobody mm -hmm. there. So he said, okay. Now, obviously, my biggest surprise was when I arrived, there was nobody to pick me up from the airport anyway. And this was Gat Gatwick Airport. So how, did you get, how did you get there? Um, when I got to Gat Gatwick, I had the address. Okay. When I arrived at Gatwick Airport, the flight arrives at about 5.30 a.m. Obviously, it was in August. The weather was a bit chilly. You know, it was like, I haven't come from a hot climate and all that. Mm. And I walked outside. I just felt the cold. I went back. <laughs> And um, I began to plan my route. JJC didn't know where to go. And uh, had so many questions. People would direct you. Go to Victoria. I didn't get all this information before I left Nigeria. So go to Victoria. From Victoria, you go to Streatham and all that. Oh, yeah, it's easy to call Streatham. You probably call it Streatham at the mm. time. So I arrived at 5 a.m. Believe it or not, I didn't get to Lion Court Road in southwest London until about 5 p.m. 
you, so you so you left at five AM to start your journey. Yeah, this is to, so you left to go from Gatwick, to which is south, which is south, <laughs> south, south London, south London to, to go to um, South West London, so, yes. and it took you twelve hours. So it took you me didn't about twelve hours. I didn't know where I was going. Yeah. So I was confused. You know, you're just confused at a point. And you think like you know, being a black person with an accent in London, in the, was it the eighties? The this was eighty nine. Yeah. So yeah. like with a little bit of racism as well, kind of like who is this man? Why are you talking to me? That's right. You, most people will even ignore you. Yeah. Because they don't understand you, rightly or wrongly, they mm. will ignore you because they don't understand your accent. Mm. So I arrived there. I got there at about 5 p.m., exhausted, having been flying all night anyway. So when I arrived there and I knocked the door, the sister who happened to be, to tomorrow I still see so much of her, Elsie or Philly, lovely lady. She's still part and part of her. Obviously, is yours, your elder brother, Dimas God mom. Uh, you know how much we hold her. I just said, uh, I didn't know her before then. Mm. Knocked at the door, she opened the door, and uh, who are you? <laughs> and the Richard's friend, coming, coming, coming. Obviously, I had to get a shower. God knows I haven't brushed my teeth for the last <laughs> three, four hours. And uh, the next meal was on the table for me. And the way she accepted me and received me was uh, one of those. Uh, situation till tomorrow I appreciate that and a uh, lot of kudos to her and the family so I know you're telling me that if you didn't have that place to stay you would have slept on the street that night you said obviously obviously if I didn't have that and I never got there I was thinking back I tried to think back what was going through my mind in that 12 hour period but I just can't remember maybe because there was an address hopefully you get there but you can only imagine if you get there if it was ever going to be there for you anyway so but I eventually got there. So if I didn't get, when I got there, or if when I had got there, and there was no one there that I know, obviously, street would have been there. I'll end up on the streets of London. Wow. So you get to this, um, you get to Auntie Elsie's house now, and you're in there. What are you thinking to do in terms of work? So long as you're ready to graft, there was a lot of manual labor all over the place. Yeah. And uh, Especially if I'm guessing for like foreigners coming in, they right. want to give them the, those kind of jobs. That's right. So you have to start from somewhere. I remember working for Smith Meter in Southwest London and going up for well, going on to work for Quick Safe Supermarket, which is no longer there. And they eventually drove taxi in London. I worked for the job center, obviously. But first, the shock, because you have this group of people like Richard as well, Elsie, they were all there to help you and give you direction. The question is, I've seen that happen to a lot of people. I'm always willing to help people that come to UK. Like you know, the number of people that's come through the house over the years, some of them, they come under the same circumstances and uh, they just come from nowhere. We've had about three people in the house who just knocked on the door and I was somewhere and they said, uh, they are here, they just arrived. Really? On, on our house? Yeah, yeah. So like yeah, without yeah, you yeah, even yeah, knowing? Yeah, maybe we were younger then, it hasn't happened. So they just showed up at the house? And they just showed up in the house. <laughs> wow. And over the years, you've had people share the house with us. Yeah. When we're living in a um, haze, a lot mm. of people came through the door, you remember? Mm, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to be displaced from your room as well. Yeah. You know, so to accommodate all them. So um, so you're working, so you, you, you move into Auntie Elsie's house, you're living there, you're working, taxi driver, um, you're doing shelves and things, basically things. Yeah, you're doing, no, no, you're, quick, quick safe supermarket. Quick, and you're doing um, job center, working job center. Yeah. And then, so what are you doing this time? Because obviously you're going to the property market. So what, are you saving all your money? Uh, what are you spending your money on? Like, how's it working? Now, what happened was, apparently when I met your mom and uh, we were thinking of what to do, and I just said to her one day, I was in the civil service at the time, driving. Th when I finished from the job center, I would drive cab in the evenings to make extra money, which actually paid off because uh, as at four years into the country, I already bought my first property. Four years in the country? Y yes. I so, bought my first property in East Ham in 1992. And that was to live, right? But yeah, just to live, yeah. yeah. Um, how much How much that property? 42,000. It was you a two-bedroom. Uh, you have to deposit 10% at least, 5%. Oh, five percent, so it's like yeah, two thousand yeah, pounds. Yeah, the property was forty-two thousand pounds. Yeah, and it was a 
three bedroom mid Terence house on St. Olive's Road. Yeah. Your elder brother Dima was born at that address. So it was it was two thousand pounds for the property and then forty two thousand. But you pay five percent deposit. You pay five percent deposit, then I got a finance from a nationwide building society. Okay. So in total deposit you paid about three thousand pounds basically. Uh, yeah, about three two thousand five hundred or there about I paid. Two thousand five hundred. And were you saving up for this property? Obviously. At that stage my salary at the job center was probably about seven hundred and fifty pounds a month. <laughs> then next Extra income coming out. I was good. I yeah. was really good because yeah. uh, hard work obviously paid. Why that was going and I made extra income from driving taxis and uh, mini cab, not the way yeah. it's highly regulated to the then it wasn't that And I think that's a that's a really good important note as well, the fact that you made a lot of we made a fair amount of money just, right. just using manual labour, like doing taxis, work job centre. I think Absolutely. that a lot of young people today they think that to make a lot of money you have to do like trading or crypto or yeah, you know, we didn't yeah. have that. And these are all amazing things to do but not enough people realise if you need money and quick these uh, and I yeah. think that even if you look at like olden times like you know the ancient ice age you know when we were like cavemen that's how we ate we used to use our hands Absolutely. to eat and, yeah, and yeah. hunt food and, and we kill still food do. don't you we still see us do. eat Nigerian food without uh, uh, even uh, you eat sometimes <laughs> exactly you, you drop your cutleries and get on with it exactly you? So, and um, sometimes it's even tastier to eat your chips as well and your Sunday hands, roast with yeah. your fingers rather than uh, yeah, Is that again? So even now, like you, you didn't have you had skills, but you, you had English. You didn't have many skills, but what you did have was hard work. And I think that Absolutely. for anybody that now watching this and this, that wants to make more money, you got just hard work. <laughs> like you know, like you can use your hands up until obviously you can't you, you can't be rich off that. Mm. But if you want to get to the first step, the first step is hard work. Like even myself, Absolutely. like I look at homeless people, and one time I had a conversation with a homeless person, and I said to him. Um, cause was, and this, this is what before I learned that sometimes homeless people can't be saved but I said to him like I always think if I was homeless tomorrow what would I do to kind of get back on my feet and I said that one thing I would do is I would literally go into shops and ask to clean their floors because I'm thinking that if, you, if they play a cleaner so say for example they play a cleaner say they, say, let's play, say they clean up, um, £100 for the night I'm like give me 50 a shop is gonna some, some will say no of course which is part of the game but mm. some will say yes and if I say cool you're paying a clean up of £100 let me do it for 50 and I'm homeless kind of thing so I think that when I look at homeless people or people that want to make more money if you haven't got the skill sets of yet or something from zero like you did you came to the country with nothing you say you say that your friend's house you could have slept in the streets you, you can start with hard work and labour you can drive taxis yeah, you yeah. can clean floors you can yeah. do whatever you need to do to get on your feet and you did that and that, that's how you got your first property and that's how you got your first step on the property ladder absolutely so I just want to make sure that's clear for everybody so cool you got your first property now mm. Um, as you, when you're working, when you're living in East Ham, are you still driving taxis? And you I still... was, I was. Okay. Yeah, I was doing that as a secondary job and uh, I now met your mom and uh, when we met, I told her what we discussed and we decided that she could end up in housing, which was the job everybody wanted at the time. It was a market job for most of us foreigners at the time that just arrived. I said, no, but... It's a civil service, another civil service job. We're not going to make so much money. What would you like to do? And somehow she said hairdressing, which was strange, you know. Um, I used to go to Baba at the time to cut my hair and be old. I said, okay, if that's what you want to do, we have to learn to do it. And going forward, you, she actually went to a place on Leighton High Road, Leighton Stone High Road, and learned to... to, to to yeah. make female hair from a Nigerian salon owner, which she did for about six months. At this time, I was still driving taxi, going on. And was mom, was she working as well? Or she learned to do hair? She was working, but she was just paid little or nothing, peanuts. Was but she the working? idea, I say hairdresser. Oh, but she was learning how to, okay, That's but right. they were paying her peanuts. Okay. The peanuts. But yeah. The target was for us to open our own salon yeah. there, from there. So behold, she did that for about six months. Leading up to Christmas, I think she was earning some silly money, something like 60 pounds. A month? A week. A week, okay. And that was very annoying to me for the hours and the hard work oh, she that working. she was putting in. Yeah. I think Christmas approached at the time. And I don't want to call this salon. So when Christmas approached, uh, they wanted her back on boxing. They haven't walked on New Year's Eve, on Christmas Eve. And I said, no. So at that stage, straight away, she said to me, honey, we have to go on and uh, open our shop. Yeah. And there wasn't much money around anyway. But uh, I said, okay, that's fine. Um, I had uh, two cars at the time, a lovely Sapporo. 
<laughs> and uh, which I treasured so much. And we thought about it. You always have to have a breakthrough in life. But sometimes some breakthroughs will come in different ways. Being in, having had a property was easy for my landlord to give us the shop at the time because that came with a lot of stories as well. I understand that I went to a bank, I don't want to call the bank now, and I said I needed, with a business proposal, that I want to open a salon, and they declined the loan. And when they declined, there was only 10,000 pounds I needed. It was declined. So straight away I put the car up for sale. While I was driving taxi, eventually I was looking at premises when I dropped the, uh, the fare. So when I eventually found a shop, which surprisingly enough were living in uh, East Ham, and the first shop I found was in Housden yeah, no. on Craven Park Road, which... You uh, still earn to stay? Yeah. So I didn't know what housing was like at the time. Hmm. Not, not, uh, it's not not Chelsea. Yeah, it was it's it wasn't nice Chelsea. Bridge. Yeah, but I didn't know. But yeah. your instinct is leading you. There were a lot of uh, Afro Caribbeans around the neighborhood, so we decided to go for it. So the car was all for sale, and why the car was all for sale? Whatever amount I was going to make from the car wasn't going to be enough to get out the shops. Some reason a friend of mine, I remember him vividly, went to his bank and got a car loan. Uh, the banks arranged car loans at the time, and I went to the bank, which was in the right thing to do, or was in the whether I rightly or wrongly. And the bank gave me the ten thousand pounds they had declined on a business loan for a car loan, having applied as a car loan. So the bank money was sitting in my bank account, and I made a landlord out of the property. Who was who was in a rack trade somewhere in West London? So the bank needed reference. <laughs> so sorry, the landlord needed reference. So I said, okay, the money is in the bank account, and uh, to write to my bank. The bank manager called me to this letter, uh, and uh, for an interview, I went to the my my branch was in South London. And when I got to the interview, he said you apply for a business. True story. You apply for a business loan, which you didn't get. And now you decided to get a big card loan. I want to use it for business. What do I know about business? And I said to her, my wife has a degree in business. Secondly, you've given me the 10,000 pounds loan based on my income in the civil service working in the job center. And if you've given me that loan on that basis, I have the option. I have the job and anyway, I can still pay your loan. But it's up to you whatever you decide to do with the reference. And they replied to the landlord and said to him, if Mr. Kodo thinks he can pay for your premises, then he believes he can. So Mr. Singh called me and said, Andy, I'm going to give you a chance. I always remember that word. I still do it tomorrow when I meet people, even tenants when they come to lend property. Sometimes they don't need a reference, say so you take it, but don't let me down. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, even my commercial properties as well, I do with them as well. I said to him, go ahead, take it. Uh, Mr. Singh said to me, I'll give you a chance. I said, brilliant, go on, and good luck. So just to circle back then, so what happened was that my mum was working long hours. That's right. In a hairdresser. Yeah. And um, you weren't happy about that. So you said it's time to open up your own shop, but yeah. obviously you didn't have much money. That's right. So you... Went to get a loan from the bank for a business loan yes. and they declined you. That's right. So you thought, let me get a car loan and, and they accepted it. That's it. And that says so Same much bad. about society, about how the way that, if that doesn't tell you how the world works, <laughs> then I don't know what does. The fact that you can get money for a car, yes. which is a liability, yes. and they will happily give it to you. They happily give it to you. But when it comes to a business that can create you income and wealth, they're, they're saying no. No. Anyway, so you used that money from the car loan, 10000 and then the, obviously the bank found out that you want to use the money for business. Business, and, and they called me in for an interview. And he said that, what do you know about business? Yeah, and what, did you, and you, what did you tell him? I just said to him, well, my wife studied business administration, and secondly, you've given me the loan based on my income in the yeah, job so sense. Okay, yeah. So your money is not at risk anyway, because I have the job. Yeah. If the business fail. I, you can still get your money from my income. And Mrs. Singh said, I'll give you a chance. And That's right. Fast forward, how many years later now? 30? Oh, this was in 1995. So That's we're looking at 30 years. About 30 years. So years. say they say the chance paid off then. Yeah, could you absolutely. Still, could you still own the property to this day? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. crazy. <laughs> so, so behold, so <laughs> that was the trajectory there for that instance. And uh, we got there. I was shampooing here when we started. 
my wife was a hairdresser. I was a junior stylist mm. or the assistant. I would shampoo ladies, uh, take off their wig, their extensions. And, and how old are you at this point? Um, um, I was in my in my late thirty. Sorry, thirties. Early thirties. So nineteen ninety five. Yeah. So you're you're born sixty four. So you're right. thirty one. That's right. Thirty one. Yeah. Wow. So I would do that. So when we started, uh, funnily enough, one day. I was still come back home. I walk in the dark lands, pick up your mom. She was pregnant for your brother, your elder brother. And we would drive all the way from... She would drive to housing in the morning and I would join her from I Love Dogs at the end of the day. Then I would drive back home while she was pregnant and she would have been working all day. So from there, we employed quite... We had about 40 points. We had about 45 staff. 45 staff? In five shops. Full-time we, staff? Yeah, oh, yeah, you had a quite a few. So good. Yeah. So what revenues were you looking at at that point when you got 45 staff, what revenues? It was good revenue. It was good income because the barbers were renting. So how much? How much money? I can't remember, but we were taking a good four, 5,000 every week. Four, 5,000 a week? Yeah, a week, yeah. So a month, that's, that's like 20,000 a month. That's right. So a year, you're looking at 240,000 a year. That's right. Okay, is that why the 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 ML the Mercedes ML is that when that came in? Oh well, yeah, you, <laughs> the ML came in in two thousand and three. Yeah, and uh, we paid for very cash. And and mom mom told me that um when you first opened the shop you didn't have any marketing so you put a flyer on the shop window. That's it. Yeah. And then you had no clue how many people were gonna come. And then. But by the time we opened, we hadn't finished the job. But by the time we opened, on the day we opened, we're due to open a week later. But we go home, as I was coming home, the, uh, we ran out of money to continue the work in the shop. That's why the yeah. back of the shop wasn't done till after a year or two. So we ran out of money. And I just said to her, we have to open. <laughs> so we just put a note. I just went to the code, my laptop or my computer, printed it out, opening tomorrow. So we opened. Uh, the next day when we arrived, both of us, we didn't sleep all through the night anyway wow. because we didn't know what was going to happen. You're nervous. Yeah, we're nervous and we didn't know what was going to happen. And behold... As soon as we turned around Craven Park Road, front of the shop was full. Clients were waiting. Wow. Uh, we only prepared for her to be the stylist and Andy to be the, <laughs> the assistant. When we got in there, the number of people queuing at the door was amazing. And uh, we barely survived the day. Yeah. And this was on a Thursday, I believe. By the Friday, the shop was packed, Saturday. Luckily enough, on the first day, we had two people queuing at the door looking for a job. So you hired them immediately? So we hired them immediately. We yeah. didn't even have to, You don't have to bother about references and all that. And, 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 and how old are you at this point? 31 years? Yeah, about so, so you've gone from living in Ila, poverty, yeah. everything, That's going right. to school, doing all this, to now making four to five thousand pounds a week of hairdresser. Absolutely. How are you? Are you like thinking, I'm the man? Like, I'm that no, the hard work point. was there. Yeah. You know, at that stage, you are not looking at fate. You're looking at other things to do. It was quite a difficult job. You have to give credit to hairdressers. Yeah, yeah, You're of course. Yeah. All day long. We, we used to go home very tired. Then uh, one day, we had this shop, which is number 24, Craven Park Road, which we own now. We still own that the shops and the flats above. And the man there was going to sell the lease. He had a note on the door. I said he was going to sell the lease. And I said, at that stage, we had already started planning to move closer to the business from East London. Yeah. So we're looking to buy around the uh, housing. So um, at that stage, that's where the property had appreciated. So yeah. there was income. I think we paid 42 and we eventually sold for about 95 Okay. So straight away, you invested said, okay, that money. This man need uh, about fifteen thousand to sell his lease, and yeah. there was just only eighteen months left on the lease. So I said, okay, we take it. When I went to the, everybody say house and say, no, no, Steve will not sell. He's always been doing it for too long. Yeah. They were a laundry shop. They used to sell ladies' laundry. So when I go met Steve, Steve told me fifteen thousand. I said, yeah, I'll get it for you. So the house. In this town, well, our house was already, we already found the house in Hayes. Yeah. And the house in this town was already in the market and we got a buyer. So I knew straight away there was going to be money coming mm. in. So what I did, what we did, not deposit about 15000 for Hayes and 15000 Steve wanted, plus the legal fees and all that. So I said to Steve, we'll do the deal if he's ready. So I thought it was a joke. Eventually, we sold the house, we did the deal. And you got into your second property? Well, yeah, and I went Third. in there. Yeah. Now, so when we now went in there, we, we only bought the lease. 
but there were two flats above the property, number 24. It was part of the lease for 24,000. So, so you're saying for the hairdresser, before that, you didn't own the lease, before that, you were just renting? You were just renting. And now you're saying how the owner wanted to sell now? That's right. Okay, so now you've got the lease now for the hairdresser, and now you're looking at the flats above Yeah, the above the, well. yeah. So the family, wealthy family, it stops to list up Piccadilly. So he wasn't interested in repair work. So he had the next property as well, number 26. Two, two flats above, two, two bedroom flats and this commercial was downstairs. So I said to, uh, they, they would call me and say, Andy, we have problem with water leak or water escape. And they want to, can you do it for us? I just run out there, I find someone do it. Then when I'm paying my rent, I deducted it. So that sort of mm. got me close to them. So at 18 months, when the lease was due to run, I got a letter, a standard letter, a legal letter, saying your lease is coming to an end, you have to evacuate the property. Boy, this is a shock. So I called them and said, oh, Mr. Libel said, no, that's a standard practice. But we were ready to give you the lease. Mm-hmm. And if you're willing and you're ready to buy as well, it's up in the market. The whole building was for £240,000. We didn't have the money. This was just 18 months. We've just done this transaction. Yeah. And uh, I just told him we didn't have the money. And I don't think the bank would loan me. Maybe the bank would have at the time, but touch wood, it didn't happen. So we'd already bought one bedroom flat in Hayes as well yeah. at this time, which is still there. So we st- kept on trading. One day I was in front of acting shop, active. I went to the shop, which we know the shop. Uh, yeah. For those that don't know, you might be aware there's probably an acting called Active. Active Which, you, which, which we're used very to well known from acting. My dad yeah. was actually the owner of that shop. So yes, if you, so that shop Active is actually, that's the shop you talk about right now. Yeah, that's right. One of them. They were, you had another one in Bonto, Cowsden and places. So we got in there. I was just, I just pulled up in front of the shop. I got a call from the son. Andy, we want to sell. And I said to, his name is Lawrence. I said to Lawrence, you want to sell? My own section say yes. Yes, they want to sell. So if you want to sell, I can buy my own unit, number 24. But I won't be buying 25, 26. And he said to me, Andy, you've been very helpful to us for the past two, three years. And I'm going to suggest that uh, if you don't want to buy both of them, they were going to auction to sell both properties. Now, both properties that was available in the market for £670,000. This was a two commercial shops downstairs, four flats above, next to each other. So I said to Lawrence, okay, give me time. I'm going to find a way to deal with it. So behold, money was coming in as well. I approached about two banks. Eventually, two of them declined it. And Lawrence and the Pefada, they were very willing. They said, Andy, as long as it's going to take you, we'll wait for you. They needed about 100,000 deposits. So I was, we're raising money from the business as well and trying to get the deposit before we get to the lenders. So after about 11 months, after that initial conversation, we were able to raise the money and somehow Santander carried the mortgage. So you, so you raised 100,000 pounds? Yeah, we were able to raise 100,000. And that was from the business? From the business and from my friend, a friend of mine loan me some of them. Well, another one actually gave me his American Express card, <laughs> which I later paid off. Yeah. But that was the opportunity now to acquire another set of uh, commercial products. Okay, so at this point, you've got, you've had law and Tasha Hedgesar, you've used that money to invest into a one bed in Hayes. Yeah, that's right. And now you've got the act and active now yeah, and right. with the flats above it as well. That's right. So then, really, we quick, really quickly do mindful of time. So like, so you've gone from that, so now you're on that four properties. That's right. Law and Tashino, active, um, and the flats, Hayes. That's so now right. you're on 13 properties, right? Yes. And, and we're on about 13, 14 units. Well, when, when were you on your most properties? When were? When were you on your most properties? Was It was in 2007. That was the beginning of it all with so, that transaction. So what's the most property you ever owned? Is it 13 or is it more? No. For You know, you know my concept. Um, some people buy to flip. Yeah. I always buy to keep. Yeah. And when the resources are there, we add to the property. Yeah. And that is what we have done over the years. So how many do you have you owned do you own now? Um I think it's about thirteen. 13 and, and is that the most you've owned or that's in, to, the in most total? we've owned because okay. we don't flip. Okay, so, so you when don't, the resources is available, we buy so you don't, you know, it's only properties. 
No, we don't sell. We don't buy to sell. Yeah. We don't do up to sell. So now you've got 30 properties that mm. you own now and you collect mm. rental income from the properties. Absolutely. And how much does, how much do you say your portfolio is worth right now then? <laughs> I mean, it's not very far from 200,000 per annum. In terms of rental income? The, the, the rental income. In terms of net worth, how much is that? You're probably going to be looking close to maybe about 5 million or more. <laughs> wow. So you're going from extreme poverty to find your way to the UK to now and you know because I haven't million. paid so much money to prop in properties because of my business interest yeah. in other places as well which I'm thinking about coming back to in, in a few more in a year or two mm. I haven't uh, these are the commercial properties I'm not talking yeah. about all the other ones where we live and all that now you've done that but I've been on and off it yeah because uh, it's I know we've talked about it between your brothers and I, other directions to go. But credits to you and your brothers because you've never really paid mind to what is going on there, which is good because it's good for you to have experience somewhere. Then you can come in and do whatever you like. But credits yeah. to you as well because when you started all this, I remember calling you a couple of times, do you need financial help? And you always say to me, no, that if I need, I'll come back, come to you. I really actually, you've never come to me, another to your mom to say you need some kind of support, which is the same spirit as well that we started, your mom and I started with. Mm, did you hear that? Go out the mud. You know, so, <laughs> so credits to you for that. So, but they are there with a lot of potentials to increase and increase yeah. the scope. So well. then just to just run off then, last few minutes, so you've gone from, you know, living in ancient poverty food, loaf of bread, um, some sugar water to, to eat, to now having a portfolio worth upwards of £5 million. And that's just one business. You've got another business as well. Um, obviously, we live in a very, very nice house. You, you drive a very nice car, the, the G-Wagon. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody that wants to get into property? And this is like, you know, I know you've got your perspective and we've we had a back and forth about different ways to go about it, but what's your advice for a Gen Z watching this about how they can get started in property and board? But prefer, not like, you know, rent... But at not manage, but own a portfolio worth five million. Um, first hard work, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to believe. You, you have to get your hands dirty as well because you have to believe you can do it and set your stall. I'm not against people doing flashy things at a younger age, like I always say to you and your brothers as well. Your mom and I be you always believe. I always say to you no. You don't need luxurious goods. You don't need luxurious fashions and all that. Because if you buy them, obviously with a background, over time, they are nothing. They are not worth anything. Now, look at it this way. You remember when I bought my ML, I paid 40000 So ML, Mercedes, Mercedes Benz, yeah. yeah. I paid cash for it. That was about the same time we bought the Hayes property. The, not the Hayes, the... The one bedroom flat in his. The property is still there. What about 300,000 today? Mm. My ML was sold for less than a thousand pounds. You remember? Yeah. So don't get me wrong. You need a luxury aspect to get it. But don't go for the luxury when you're trying to build up. So it's possible you can do it. Now, you need breakthroughs as well, like I always said. I had breakthrough from Mr. Singh as well. And just to quickly just say that, so the runoff, so what you're saying is that you paid for a property for 40000 Yes. Your car was 40000 You paid it cash. You didn't say no finance. You no, paid it cash. That's right, yeah. And then that, when you sold that, that liability of the car... Yeah. Um, it was, after, you after 12 years after 12 you sold it for 1,000 but, you, but, but so you put 40,000 into a car into a property mm. the 40,000 pound you put in the property is now worth 300,000 yeah and it's still there and it's still there and, and you, you get rental income, income of income. about 1,300 every month and the 40,000 you put into the car is now somewhere it's in some scrapyard somewhere that's it I don't yeah. even know where it is yeah yeah okay yeah. so, so what's your next point sorry, I didn't, sorry to cut you off the next point for me is is the hard work and be focused mm -hmm. on what you want to do because that is a basic thing once you're focused and you remain focused, don't believe it's going to fall from heaven because miracle don't happen like that. You have to walk towards it. My advice is, whatever any young one is doing today, just bear in mind from the background we have explained so far, it's possible for you. Mm. But get yourself ready for it. The lenders are out there. They will deal with you. First refusal does not mean you'll not get it. Because if they refuse the first time or the banks refuse the finance, go back to them. Mm. Yeah, go back to them. Go back to the next one. Look for a broker as well. Don't be scared to pay. I have broker it tomorrow. 
that I use in buying properties. Don't be scared to pay someone to help you with the finance. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not going to use broker, it's going to cost me. No, they're there for a purpose. So if the orthodox banks will not do it for you, don't be scared. Go for the 8%, 10% interest as well. Mm -hmm. Over time, sacrifice. When we got into a property, obviously we're making money from hairdressing. But we're taking money for hairdressers to finance the property aspect because it wasn't enough to pay the mortgage. Yeah. You're going to get that. But over time, gradually, all this comes together. Cool. Amazing. So then that's good. So listen, my dad's going to be at the Real Estate Conference next Saturday. So if you want to get the... So we haven't, we haven't increased the service on property. We spoke about his journey, about his successes. But in terms of the gems for property, we haven't even touched the service yet. But at the event, he's going to be breaking down how he's brought his portfolio of 5 million upwards. So get your ticket. I think they might be sold out. But if they are available, visit thegenzclub.com to get your ticket and secure your place at that event. Cool. So final, final words then. Um, how do you wanna? How do you wanna end this? How do you wanna end this? I wanna end it. It's uh, <laughs> eventually. I'm happy for what you're doing. Uh, Daniel is still in the uni. Uh, Dima is doing very well. Your elder brother. Uh, obviously, the properties will eventually. That's our target. Uh, that's why it's called generational wealth as yeah. well. Here we go back to the who hope to retain them and keep them in the family. I think the final question I'll ask you then is that what are you most proud of? Like, you know, I think you've achieved more than some people will ever achieve in two lifetimes. Some people that you've grown up in the, in your environment never made it out of that environment. They're probably still Absolutely. there to this day. Um, you know, like you've gone from you you you've started minus it minus ten, and you've overtaken people that started on ten, and you know to to get you to where you are now. So. Like, you, obviously, you've achieved a lot of financial success that, you know, a lot of people dream of achieving. Obviously, you've given birth to, you know, three children. Um, a lot of things, you know, you've, you're, obviously, knowing you, you provided for a lot of people. You've given back to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, a lot, like, you do a lot for um, the community, for a, lot, for a lot of people. And it's amazing. So, like, what would you say is something that you're most proud of? What I'm most proud of is uh, my wife behind me. And uh, she's been great. Absolutely. Without her, it wouldn't have been possible. She did all the hard work with me. I'm not just saying this. Everybody will say their wife is the next best thing in their life. <laughs> you know your mom. Over the years, in the last 15 years, I've done other business where I have to be away from home for so long period of time. And uh, she looked after the three of you to, be, to get you to where you all are today. You, Dima, Anonyi, and I'm glad. Mm. My joy is the successes we are seeing today knowing that hard work pays. And you all are aware of it because you are aware, whatever we've discussed today, you've always been aware of it of course, yeah. to a very large extent. So and you see it, remain humble. And then I think the final question then is, um, well, how do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered to a very large extent? That man that came from nothing and achieved what we've achieved. It might be minimal in modest way, but thank God for that. And the ability to help a lot of people back in Nigeria, which I still do today, where we come from originally, those I went to primary, secondary school with, you'd be surprised how much help that goes to them every month because mm -hmm. some of them cannot even afford. We are in our 60s now. Majority of them cannot afford their medical care. Yeah. Only recently, one of my classmates in secondary school, his son passed in Canada. He had nothing. And the, my old boys association will raised millions of naira to help solve that problem and uh, i said the ball rolling with the amount i gave out so what you find is my ability to come help those people hopefully history will remember me for all the good as well also between my brothers and uh, between i and my brothers we've set up a foundation which i went the last few years to help very underprivileged people back in our community like where we come from helping those that cannot afford to go to school because we believe without education we couldn't have possibly be where we are you know with our mm. background 
because I always believe coming from that background, it gives you a lot of confidence. With education, I was able to talk to bank managers here when I arrived with those difficulties of raising money yeah. and all that. If I didn't have education, after you have a degree, I have a degree. So what's the problem? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah you know. no, amazing. Thank you so much um, for coming down. Um, obviously, he's my dad, so we're going, we're going back home together. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but um, obviously, as I, as I mentioned before, like, you know, one of my biggest inspirations, I'm so glad to be able to bring you and share your story with the world as well. I'm pretty sure it won't be the first time. Um, so it won't be the last time that we do this as well so listen um, to my Gen Z's I hope you enjoyed this first episode of the Gen Z Club a very personal episode a very touching episode hope it inspired you um, get down to the real estate conference next week Saturday if you want to hear more not just from my dad but also some other incredible speakers and um, your network is always your net worth man so I'll see you all soon thank you thank you very much Uche and thank Austin you. for bringing this together and uh, remain humble whatever you do I'm so proud of what you've achieved as well, well thank done. you thank you